Well, hi, I'm Ivy. And I'm Susan and Lee and Philip, thank you so much for inviting us. I'm really thrilled to be here. The, the two of us wrote this book um, for everyone. And Lee, I'm so happy to hear that you're happy with the book because I think you've been such an amazing inspiration for Ivy, but also for me, so thank you. Um, our goal is to fuel a movement where the arts are used in service of humanity. And the book covers many forms and their benefits. But today we're gonna share some of the most surprising neuroaesthetics findings about the arts and aesthetics so that, and things that you might not have already known about. We're also gonna share a few examples of their impact. So we believe that we're standing on the verge of a cultural shift in which the arts can deliver potent, accessible, proven health and well being solutions to billions of people. We've been optimizing for productivity, I believe, since the Industrial Revolution, and we've kind of pushed the arts aside or made them a luxury, thinking that the focus on productivity would make us happy, but we're not as a society, I believe. In fact, we're seeing the impact of that surge in the increase of mental health issues and physical decline, and many communities are also suffering. And when we say the arts, this is just a list. We're talking about not just visual art, but the arts as listed here. So um, this made Ivy and I think deeply about the role of the arts once played in our lives. Um, in the book, we, talk, we talked with indigenous people around the world and we learned that there are still actually over 500 active tribes. And many of these folks don't have a separate word for art because it's how they live their daily lives. They create, they sing, they dance, tell stories, draw images, and they're part of an intergenerational ritual and traditional life. This is an image of the Colombian rock painting representing um, long ago daily rituals. Another example of this is a piece that was found by geologist David Zhang in Tibet. It's believed to be 225,000 years old. And if you look closely, you can see that this artwork actually represents symbolic hands and feet. So these are the very same tools that we use to create our world today. And we know that humans have always been both the maker and the beholder of art since the beginning of time. And arts and aesthetic experiences in all their forms have been used for so many purposes, including things like self-expression, communications, collaboration, reflection, healing, and flourishing. They are, in fact, the gateways to transformation, and they're our, birth our birthright. When we were researching the book, we spoke with evolutionary biologist E.O. Wilson about the role of creativity, arts, and aesthetics. And he asked Ivy and I to imagine what it might be like to be an early human. What were their environments like? What were they experiencing? And what were they feeling? So the ancients knew what Julie Bolt Taylor, a neuronatonomist, is telling us here in this quote, that most of us think of ourselves as thinking creatures that feel, but we're actually feeling creatures that think. In fact, we now know that we experience over 34,000 feelings. And so in the spring of 2019, the two of us had the opportunity to put neuroesthetic principles into action in real time to illustrate the effects of sensory perceptions on our bodies in an exhibit called A Space for Being. It was an example of enriched environments, default node mode network and the aesthetic triad, which you will learn about uh, later in this presentation. And it came to life through a collaboration with Google, Susan's lab at Hopkins and architect Suchi Reddy, which is, she's here with us today. Participants walked into the space where they were fitted with a custom band containing sensors that were continuously taking in biological information. The participants were then invited to stay in each room for five minutes to touch, smell, listen, and explore in each of these three different rooms with no talking, no photos, no devices. Each of the three rooms were designed with a different set of neuroesthetic principles that affected the choice of colors, textures, materials, shapes, music, scent, and lighting. 
At the end of the experience, the guests had their band removed by a band tender and their data was downloaded for them only. Each visitor received a personalized data visualization revealing in which space their bodies felt the most at ease or most relaxed. This conclusion was based on real-time biological feedback being fed into the algorithm that we had developed. In over 50% of the people, the room they liked best was not the one in which the algorithm showed that their body felt the most at ease. The experiment was a success as we were able to show that what we think is not necessarily what we feel. And most importantly, our body is feeling all the time through our senses. As Ivy mentioned, this exhibition was the first time the public experienced the science of neuroesthetics, or what we call neuro arts in action. This is an emerging interdisciplinary field that has exploded over the last 20 years because technology is allowing us to get inside our heads and to study the extraordinary ways the arts actually impact us. Neural arts is the study of how the arts and aesthetic experiences measurably change your brain and body and how this knowledge can be translated into practices that advance health and well-being. These experiences alter a complex physiological network of interconnected neurological and biological systems. We now know that we are literally wired for the arts. How these systems connect and change happens through a process called neuroplasticity. Each of us are born with 100 billion neurons that connect at a synaptic level. You have quadrillions of synaptic connections in your brain, creating endless circuits and neural pathways. And these pathways underlie your body's movements, emotions, memories, basically everything that you do. When you're making a memory or learning something, you're actually making some, some synapses stronger and some synaptics weaker through the saliency of your experiences. So in this way, you're actually sculpting new pathways that have not been there before and encoding new memories. A great example of neuroplasticity can be found in the spaces and places we inhabit. In the 1960s, neuroscientist Marion Diamond designed an experiment that proved enriched environments increased the thickness of the cerebral cortex in the brain by about 6%. This was the first time anyone had ever seen a structural change in an animal's brain based on different kinds of environmental experiences. Studies have now been duplicated with humans using non-invasive technology like EEGs with similar results. The implications for creating healthier and more creative environments for all of us are really profound. These structural changes are possible because you bring the world in through your senses. The science of the senses is fascinating and beautifully illustrates the precision and power of these capabilities. Knowing how your senses work is key to understanding the transformative power of the arts and aesthetics in your life. So smell, taste, vision, hearing, touch produce biological reactions at staggering speed, absorbing millions of sensory systems. As we showed in the space for being, your entire body, not just your brain, takes in the outside world. Yet much of this sits outside of your awareness. We're only conscious of about 5% of our mental activities. The rest of your experiences, physically, emotionally, sensorially, live below what you're actually thinking. So we're gonna go spend some time right now over the next several minutes to show you some facts about thought, your five senses. And you've heard some of these things, but I think some of these will be new. But researchers have also been sharing that there are more than 50 sensory systems being discovered that we have never even known about. So smell is the oldest sense in terms of human evolution. Your nose can detect one trillion odors with over 400 types of sense receptors whose cells renew every 30 to 60 days. In fact, your sense of smell is so good that you can actually identify some specific scents better than your dog. Microscopic molecules are released by substances when you, that around you to stimulate your sense receptors, and they enter your nose and dissolve in the mucus. Here, neurons connect to these molecules and send messages to the olfactory bulb, which detects the distinct feature of a scent. 
The olfactory cortex is located in the temporal lobe of your brain, and it broadly affects things like emotion and memory. Smell instantly and potently triggers physical and mental neurobiological responses. If you think of the scent of a newborn baby or the whiff of a perfume or cologne, you know it will bring you instantly back to a long forgotten relationship. Hearing is registered quickly in about three milliseconds. The way sound works in the body is fascinating. The sounds we hear are caused by the motion of our eardrums, which causes fluid in your inner ear to move. The fluid inside the inner ear bends hairs on the cells, which convert to nerve impulses that travel to your brain. These impulses move through the brain via neural networks and evoke strong emotions and memories, altering moods and behaviors instantly. Different tempos, languages, and sound levels affect your emotions, mental activities, and physical reactions. Researchers have learned how brain waves correlate to musical beats per minute. Our brains will entrain to the beat of the music, putting us into a variety of states, including alpha waves for relaxation and delta for sleep. Sound has become an excellent tool to regulate stress and that it can work on an unconscious level. The frequency of sound instantly taps into what lies underneath our conscious recognition, literally changing the vibrations in your body. And you'll hear some more about this uh, from Lara. Sound vibration has the capacity to return the body to homeostasis and take us out of the fight, flight, freeze reaction. I've actually been known to use tuning forks in the middle of a corporate meeting to tap into a coworker's uh, physiology and help disrupt a stress cycle. Emotions are energy in motion and each has its own frequency. You know, there's a scientific uh, theory being studied now about how sound frequency increases our natural, our body's natural production of nitric oxide, which would explain how sound alleviates stress because nitric oxide enhances cell vitality and vascular flow and may account for the relaxation effect in the body. Several studies have shown that sound frequencies from things like tuning forks or even humming can cause nitric oxide to be released in our cells. These are pictures of my and Susan's actual voice made visible. There's a science called cymatics, which is making sound visible that was started back in the 50s. Our actual voices here were put through a scientific instrument called a cymoscope that John Reed developed in the early 2000s. It literally imprints sonic vibration from our voice on the surface of ultra pure water while a camera films the patterns in the water. So by making sound visible, and we all know that our bodies are made up of, I think at least 60% water, you can start to understand the impact sound has on us. I mean, think about listening to music and the patterns that are going on within our bodies, within, with the water in our bodies. Here's a short uh, example of my voice pattern being created on the cymoscope. Touch is one of the most powerful cognitive communications vehicles and one of the first sensory systems to evolve. We literally speak to one another through touch as it registers in the brain within 50 milliseconds. Your fingers, hands, toes, feet, skin are extraordinarily sensitive and pick up minute cues that trigger physiological and psychological responses. Each of your feet have more than 700,000 nerve endings, constantly taking in physical sensations. Touch receptors in your skin connect to neurons in your spinal cord, and they moved to your thalamus. Um, information about touch and texture is then transmitted to the somatosensory cortex. Touch rapidly changes your neurophysiology and state of mind by releasing a cascade of neurotransmitters such as serotonin, oxy, oxy, oxytocin, and dopamine. To see, we process light through a complex system. Your eyes work in a similar way as a camera. Images are converted into electrical signals by photoreceptors. 
the optic nerve then sends these signals to the occipital lobe in the bracket in the back of your brain and converts them into what you see. This is where we perceive, recognize, and appreciate objects. Researchers are now discovering the lateral occipital lobe contributes to how we process and create an aesthetic appreciation of art. And like scent, taste is also a chemical sense. Food triggers your 10,000 plus taste buds, creating electrical signals that travel from your mouth to the part of the brain responsible for the perception of taste and flavor. This is the part of the brain that processes visceral and emotional experiences, and it helps to explain why taste is so effective at making powerful memories. Baking bread, eating together has shown to make people less argumentative and less judgmental and more willing to compromise. Potluck suppers are popping up around the world since COVID, a trend that is bringing us back to the table and to each other. Jose Andreas the, from the World Kitchen, from the World Central Kitchen, calls this humanity's deeper hunger to connect. This illustration is of, of the brain by Gray Dunn, and it's in the middle of our book. It beautifully depicts the areas of the brain that our senses engage and gives us the, an idea of the complex nature of these experiences. Researchers are discovering that through highly salient experiences like arts and aesthetics, the quadrillions of new synapses that are formed in your brain to create a repository of stored knowledge and responses are as unique as your fingerprints. No one else, not a single person, has your exact brain. But you couldn't possibly pay attention to all of the sensory stimuli that are coming into your body or the many feelings and thoughts that emerge. Your brain filters out the inputs that seem irrelevant and focuses attentions on what it believes to be pertinent. In fact, it actually prunes or deletes what's no longer relevant. Because what is salient to you is important to you either for practical or emotional reasons, it stands out. There are several regions in your brain that helps to determine what is salient. These areas have been identified as the saliency network. And this network moderates switching between the internal and external processing of the two main brain controls called the central executive network and the default mode network. Ivy mentioned the default mode network earlier. This is where the neurological basis of self is housed. It's your brain's meaning-making machine that connects the dots, finds patterns, and makes sense of the world. It's also where you decide what you like and don't like. It's what is beautiful and isn't beautiful to you. And what each of us perceive and how we process this information is highly individualized. The default mode network processes incoming sensory information when you are quiet. It goes to work when new stimuli is not entering your body. In other words, we need to hit the pause to process the world. If you've ever wondered where in your head you daydream, mind wander, or think to yourself, the default mode network is the place. It's the place where we know um, the default mode network is one of the reasons why you are what you experience. And to take this one step further, neuro neuroscientist Anjan Chatterjee and his colleagues developed a theoretical model called the aesthetic triad that helps to explain how and why we each perceive the world from our unique perch. The triad has three components. The first is knowledge, knowledge meaning, which includes where you come from and what you know. The second is sensory motor or your physiological systems that are engaged. And the third is your emotional evaluation or how you feel about something. At the center of these intersecting circles is where your unique aesthetic experiences or moments are achieved. And the more salient these experiences, the greater the aesthetic experience. So, we believe that we're all craving these salient aesthetic experiences, whether we're conscious of it or not, as our brain and heart know that they're good for us. It's why we're starting to see so many immersive art experiences. And recently, Susan and I experienced one that stands out that we wanted to share with you. Chromasonic is a cultural impact enterprise, a collaborative studio and research lab made up of sound artists, musicians, and multimedia and installation artists in Venice, California. Satellites like this one that Susan and I visited are permanent. They are local neighborhood sites built into existing architecture where participants can form a practice around super sensory 
chromosonic experiences for improved well being. This full body immersion in a curvilinear space appears boundless and infinite from within, transporting participants into a new awareness of perception, inspiring a radical state of presence in community with others, fusing science with art in sound and light. The melding of sensory modalities blurs boundaries between physical and perceived realities, suspending participants in time and space. Chromosonic installations are synesthetic experiences where participants see sound and hear light. You're in this space, keeping your eyes open with sound and music playing, but you're, and you're seeing light that is correlated uh, to the sound. As Susan mentioned earlier, the more sal salient these experiences, the greater the aesthetic experience. And I'm sure that this experience rewired our brains. You know, many of the best examples of these experiences we've been finding end up being a result of multidisciplinary collaborations, like a French interior designer and furniture maker with an acclaimed director to create a new stage set for an opera opening up in June at a theater in Switzerland. His dramatic stage uh, set design is composed of a central structure of three rotating walls painted blue and red evoking flower petals. These walls move along a 360 degree circular track turning and shifting as the storyline evolves. Every position creates an entirely new backdrop for the characters. The combination of curves which we know is evolutionarily important, along with color, textures, movement, lighting, and storytelling, heightens the experience of the opera physically and emotionally. Immersive and interactive exhibits like this dissolve the boundaries between art and viewers, engaging our senses and creating strong emotional reactions that enhance our learning and memory. Science is now proving what artists have always known, that we are wired for art. Here are just a few examples of the many findings that have come out in the last few years, including museum visits are being prescribed by doctors to enhance sensory engagement and plasticity, increasing cognitive skills. Dance improves gait, mood, sleep, cognition for people with Parkinson's disease. And one of our favorites is that one or more art experience a month can extend your life by 10 years. Art is our one true global language. It speaks to our need to reveal, heal, and transform. It transcends our ordinary lives and lets us imagine what is possible. The World Bank says that without strong and diverse cultures, economies can't grow, inner healing, health and well being suffer, and opportunities are lost. We are ultra social creatures who biologically evolved to belong to something greater than ourselves. The success of our species comes down to this. Art creates culture, culture creates community, and community creates humanity. Storytelling, dancing, singing, and so many other art forms are all part of our evolutionary DNA. We've just touched on a fraction of the information in the book that weaves together stories of people in the arts with the science to explain why the arts are imperative for both our individual and collective health. And Judy, who I'd like to turn it over to in a minute, uh, a great friend and also a huge inspiration to me, is a great writer and artist whose work you see here on the slide. Um, we'll start by introducing us to her perspective on storytelling. Because you know, releasing stories into the world have been shown to lower our cognitive load just simply by sharing them, regardless if anyone actually ever hears them. So let me take the slide down. 